I love the option that I can leave the meeting at this point. <laughs> Sorry, I'm out of here. <laughs> Hey everybody, we're going to get started in just a minute. Um, we'll give you some time to get in and get settled. Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome everyone uh, to our webinar today, Zoom Zoom, helping your virtual sessions take off. It is presented by David Rosengren, President and CEO of Prevention Research Institute. It is also brought to you today by the Great Lakes MHTTC and SAMHSA. The Great Lakes MHTTC and ATTC and PTTC are all funded under the following cooperative agreements. This presentation today was prepared for the Great Lakes MHTTC under that cooperative agreement. And the opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the official position of DHHS or SAMHSA. MHTTC believes that words matter the MHTTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all of its activities. Um, we have some housekeeping details for you today. Um, if you are having technical issues, please individually message either Christina Spanbauer or Stephanie Bellman in the chat section at the bottom of your screen, and they'll be happy to assist you. Um, Please put any questions that you have in the Q&A section, also at the bottom of the screen, and we will respond to those following the presentation. Um, our presentation is 90 minutes today, so if you need to take a short break during the training, please do so. You will be directed to a link at the end of the presentation to a very short survey. We would really appreciate it if you fill it out. It takes about three minutes. Um, we will be recording this webinar and it along with the slides will be available on our website. Um, certificates of attendance will also be sent to all of those who attend the full session. They take about 10 days um, and we should have everything posted on our website within a week to 10 days as well. If you would like to see what other things are going on with um, the Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, or PTTC, please follow us on social media. And again, I am excited to introduce our presenter today, um, David Rosengren, and I will turn it over to you, David. All right, great. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, uh... <sighs> I, I'm not even sure I can say all those, the prevention ATTC, the mental health ATTC, and the addictions. <laughs> it's confusing, all those TTCs. Thank you all. So I'm glad to be here. And it looks like you've disabled my sharing. So if you can let me share my screen, Christina or Stephanie, that would be fabulous. You're good to go now. Sorry about that. That's okay. We'll make this work. So hello, everybody. Um, I would imagine that as we go to talk here, this is the session you came for because you had some things of interest that you were hoping to get out of today's meeting. And I'd like to find out a little bit about what those things are. Um, so in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to put some things in the chat box here. And some of you have already begun doing that. 
with regards to the chat box, I'd like you to put in where you're joining from, what you're looking forward to this holiday season, and what would make this session feel productive for you. So if you'd go ahead and put those things in there, that would be great. And while you're doing that, let me just give you a little background on who I am, since I'm sure many of you have never heard of me before and wondering who this guy is. So I work for an organization that's headquartered in Lexington, Kentucky called Prevention Research Institute. And we create drug and alcohol prevention and treatment curriculum and then train people to use those things. We are a private nonprofit which means we're about the mission, not about the money. Um, but we do need to do things to keep the lights on and the doors open. So one of the things that we'll be looking at a little bit later today is part of a treatment program that we've developed called Prime Solutions. I'm just going to use that as an example to show you some of the things that we're talking about and how those might get applied in a particular treatment setting. So. Normally, I would say we're going to train today the same way that we would do the session. We are going to do some elements like we would do a session, but it's a little bit hard when we have a uh, webinar of up to potentially 400 people here who are going to be joining us. So a little bit hard to have breakouts and those kinds of things. So as we're looking through here the list, I see lots of people joining from all over kind of the Great Lakes region there. Um, effectively engaging people, I am hearing how to use Zoom, engaging people, appreciating, boosting confidence, all those things. Okay, great goals. Um, so we'll try to keep those things in mind as we go along here. And I want to, I want to begin with some things that you actually might begin your group with. So first thing I want to do is help you all just kind of come into the room now. I know that it's a busy time of the year. There's a lot of things going on. There's many demands on people's schedules. Taking time out to join something like this requires you to shift activities. So I want us to just take a moment to breathe here for a minute. And you're welcome to close your eyes or to leave them open as we're doing this. And we're only going to spend a minute or so. So it's not a long period of time. I would encourage you to just put your feet flat on the floor. You can allow your hands to just drop into your lap. And I want you to just breathe in, noticing the breath coming in through your mouth and then breathing out through your nose and mouth. And just notice that breath coming in and going out and coming in and going out and now taking the breath in a little bit deeper into your lungs, feeling the breath come in and the breath go out, feeling it come into your lungs, breathing in and the breath going out. And now feeling it all the way down in your belly, feeling your belly rise, and fall as that breath comes in and out. And as you're doing that, you may have some thoughts pass through your head. And I want you to just focus and allow these to pass through, continuing to breathe, saying to yourself, may I be well, may I be happy, May I be peaceful. May I be loved. Again, may I be well. May I be happy. May I be peaceful. May I be loved. And continuing to allow those thoughts to pass through your head as you're breathing in and out, in and out. May I be well, may I be happy, may I be peaceful, may I be loved. And then you can 
open your eyes, come back to this time and place and keep those feelings with you, whatever they were. And now I'm going to ask you to do something a little quickly here. And we'll talk a little bit about it afterwards. But I want you to think about someone in your life that you feel gratitude to or thankful for. And I want you to take a moment and just pull your phone out and send a quick text to this person right now. So just send a quick text to this person that you feel grateful to or feel gratified. Uh, gratitude for. All right. Now, if you would, in the chat box, I'd just be curious as to what happened in that opening that we just did for you. What, what was your experience of that as we did the breathing exercise and you sent this message out into the world? Yeah, I'm just feeling joy, relaxation, calm, relaxing, peace, peaceful, very relaxing, peaceful, recentered me from a hectic morning, feel lighter. Yeah. Uh, for some people, a little less. Yeah. Okay, so as those messages continue to come in, come in here, I want to just point out that for many of you, this was a, it was a very centering, kind of relaxing, peaceful, calming experience as you were coming into something that presumably had reasonably low demand, but in some ways comes in the midst of a very busy time. For, but that isn't everyone's experience, and I think it's important to be mindful of that. And at the same time, it's think about this in terms of how are we entering people into our groups? What are the emotions that we're asking them to bring in with them? And today we're talking particularly around young people and what happens with them. So let's just keep that in mind as we move forward. And I'm going to start with a basic premise here, and that is great groups don't just happen. In fact, uh, this doesn't mean that every group is going to be a great group, but there are things that we can do that increase the likelihood of this being a great group in this particular group session being a great group session. And one of the things we can do is really think about what are our expectations for that group. We'll talk about setting theirs and ours and what are, what's a particular form of things we could do to help set that stuff up. But thinking about how we start groups really matters. But I wanna start with a little discussion about the group that we're, ref that we're really targeting today, and that is young people. And I haven't defined a particular age range because my guess is that you're working across sort of a, a range of from teens to young adults and all the rest here. So we're just referred to those folks as young people. And I think one of the things that's really important for all of us to keep in mind as you all is that brain development plays a big part of what's going on at this point in people's lives. And particularly for those teens and into early adulthoods and, and for boys versus girls, we see different rates of brain development. And in particular, we see the limbic system and the other sort of emotional centers in the brain taking on more adult kind of reactivity to things. So we experience the strong emotions of adulthood, but we don't have that prefrontal cortex kind of fully regulating all of that as well as the life experience to help us know that some of these things are temporary and that we're going to pass through them. So it's that intensity 
and combined without some of the things that those of us who've been around the block a time or two longer have experienced that help us moderate those things out. So I think that part of the equation is important for us to remember and that for many young people, they like to have strong emotional experiences. It fits within their wheelhouse for that reason. And the second part of this is that we've got age appropriate desires for young people. And those include things like moving away from family and being more engaged with friends, exploring new freedoms as they become more capable to operate within their environment. And then this sort of broad exploration of identity that happens across a number of domains, particularly as people move towards um, 18 and potentially moving outside of the house and all the rest. And then we have these basic psychological needs that the self-determination theory folks would tell us are important for all people and are particularly important for young people. And that is we need to have an experience of competence that we need to feel capable and like we can impact our environment. We all need that teens, youth, young adults all need that as well. We need to feel related. We need to feel connected to the people around us like they matter to us and we matter to them. And of course, for youth, there's a, a lot of spheres that people operate within. And then there's autonomy. And this is the one that often gets confusing for folks. They associate autonomy with independence around choice. And it's not the same thing. Autonomy is really about making decisions that are consistent with our values and the things that are most important to us, some of which we have free choice about and some of which we don't um, along the way. Okay. And then we add on top of all of those things I just talked about, the pandemic, which has required youth to and young adults to be spending time at home in ways that they might not typically have done. And then having to do things like school on Zoom and doing it all day long and not being able to see their friends, not being able to engage with them. And so they're really tired of Zoom and the different activities that are required of them. And so when we talk about coming to a treatment program and having to do Zoom, there may be less enthusiasm about that than if there were, weren't all these things going on. And then finally, the thing I would say we need to keep in mind is that these are folks who are device natives. So unlike people of my generation who didn't grow up with devices, my 16 year old who's at home, as well as the, the ones who are a little bit older, grew up with devices. They know how to operate. When my middle son was 13, I was having some trouble with the internet. And he said, he grabbed his laptop and said, here, I can fix that. And he went in and he reset the router um, from his laptop. And I said, how did you figure out how to do that? And he said, I don't know. I just kind of messed around and figured it out. And it was right then that I knew that all my parental safeguards that I had put on the system were totally ineffective. He was way ahead of me. And so I think it's important to remember that as we try to navigate this new system using Zoom and all the rest that, that these are folks who are probably better at it than we are. And I'm going to come back to that as we go along, because one of the principles that I operate with in a variety of settings are use all the brains in the room. When you run into trouble, use all the brains. And so if you have a problem with Zoom, allowing your young people to assist you in problem solving that can not only be really helpful, but it meets some of those basic psychological needs that I was just talking about around competence and relatedness and all the rest. Okay, keeping those things in mind here. Some expectations that I like to communicate to folks around groups, and we've spent a lot of time at PRI training people, and that's how Laura and I and the folks here at the Great Lakes ATTC came together was how do we do some of these things in group settings? And we've been doing a lot of this at PRI, help, helping people make the transition. And one of the things we say are really important is figuring out 
what your expectations are and making sure you're going to communicate those to folks. So, you know, if you go into the pool in the belly flop form, you're likely to get one kind of reaction versus another. So the one of the things that we created early on was a netiquette form that we just send to everybody before the first group. So everybody gets it, they know what the expectations are. And since we're working around drug and alcohol things, we set clear expectations around not using substances, including vaping while people are in the, our groups. We also have a clear expectation that cameras will be on, that that's a requirement that in order for us to be able to do our jobs, we need to be able to see people, see what's going on. And so we really set that as an expectation. And if for some reason it can't be on, we need to have a discussion about all that. We've also found that even though for many young people, they're far more likely to be working on um, tablets or phones, that computers can be preferable when you're having to do things that involve images or some of the other things where people are having to switch back and forth between programs. Now, tablets may work a little bit better. Phones are not great around that stuff. And so we really encourage people to use computers if they can. Um, and the next one on the on our list there, not driving seems like a no brainer, but it's really surprising how often that comes up. And so we're just really clear when we force people to have cameras on, we can tell when they're driving and we ask them to pull over and not drive while they're doing that. Um, uh, one of those orders of business thing is we talk with folks about what happens if you become disconnected. And we also talk about what happens if I, as the group leader become disconnected. We typically, if I'm the only person in the group leading the group, I'll assign one other group member to be a co-host. So if the group goes down, then I let them know that the group will continue and they should continue the discussion. I'll hop back in. And then the last thing about expectations is we make the obvious obvious. And that is that we're working in environments and in, in meeting in environments that none of us have ever used before. And we're using Zoom, which is new to many of us. And so we note that things are gonna come up. Dogs and cats are gonna show up. We have coworkers at home in terms of siblings for, for young people, as well as parents and those kinds of things. And we as providers have all those things going on as well. So we'll talk about settings in a little bit, but when something comes up, we just comment it on. When the dog starts barking in the background, we just comment on it and then let it go, okay? All right, so let's talk about settings here. Theirs and ours. So in terms of theirs, this is one of those things where when people were coming into our space as young people, it was much easier to create a, a private safe place for people than it is now in a Zoom environment. So one of the things we wanna make sure is that they can find a private place where their conversations are not being overheard and those kinds of things. And that's more difficult with everybody stuck at home. Now, I know this varies by location and rural versus urban and what's going on, but I think it's important to just bear in mind that these things have shifted and particularly for adolescents, um, they may have less control over their ability to choose places in their environment. So we wanna, do things like suggest they use earbuds or headphones or those kinds of things to um, create privacy for other people who are a part of a conversation as much as possible to be able to close a door and be on their own and for us to kind of check in and make sure they're on their own and feel safe. And getting back to that whole thing around um, autonomy, allowing them as much choice around those things as we can and operate in a way that feels consistent with who they are. In terms of our setting, I want you to think about what does your situation look like to the clients? When the camera looks out at me, it's also looking at everything that's going on behind me. So what do I have going on behind me? Do I have a bunch of clutter or those kinds of things? Do I have messages on pictures or those kinds of things? Are these the elements that I wanna be conveying to the participants in my group? 
and allowing both myself as well as my clients to do things like virtual backgrounds if that makes people feel more comfortable, more safe. They're not having to reveal things about themselves that they don't want to do. Okay. I do encourage you to think about decluttering it as much as you can. Now, this is a, a home office. It's a workplace. I need to be able to have some of my things around. So there's a limit to how much stuff I can get rid of. But, you know, keep in mind what you've got behind you and are there things you can clear out. Think about attire. What's the attire you would wear to the office? You may want to choose the same sort of attire for the groups that you're doing here. And, you know, it's one of those things we all laugh about people working in their pajama bottoms and all the rest. And that's one of those things that I think you have to figure out what is right for you. But just bear in mind that this is a professional circumstance and that oftentimes uh, if we dress professionally, it impacts how we feel in that circumstance. Okay. All right. Last two things I want to talk about. One are rules for the household when you're on a session. This is really important to figure out about when can people come into your space. On my door, I have a sign that indicates, yes, you can come in or, you know, stop, only come in if the house is in on fire and or someone is bleeding, you can't stop the bleeding. Otherwise, you know, don't interrupt me. And we kind of have, as a family, have gone over those rules about when you can come in or not. Now, if you have young children in the home, that can be a little harder. You got dogs and cats, that's more of an issue. I would say with regards to adolescents, as well as young adults, that um, grounding and things like that can be really important and pets can be important. So allowing folks to bring in their pets and to have them be a part of your groups with you is something that you might wanna consider. You also need to think about in terms of their setting, are you okay with things like them being on their bed? Some folks don't like that idea at all. Personally, I'm a little more relaxed around all of that. I just as soon have them be present in a setting that feels comfortable, but I do have expectation that they're going to have clothes on and all that kind of stuff. So just that kind of stuff that you need to be clear about. All right. Third thing I want to talk about here around expectations is that if you are starting a new closed group, or if you have a group that's been ongoing and you're wanting to move it to an online setting, it can be helpful to do something like a meet and greet session where you bring folks together for a relatively brief period of time before the treatment actually begins. And I would schedule this as a separate session typically and set the timing for this to be about 30 minutes, maybe up to 45, but not a full hour. Um, I want to keep it short, make it fun, and the purpose of this is for folks to come in, meet each other, learn the different functions in this environment. Again, with digital native folks, it may be less of an issue, but things like how do they mute themselves quickly, how do they turn the camera off if they need to do that, all of those kinds of things, all right? And then having people share an object for example, as a focus around all of this is something that I will do, have them bring something in that isn't necessarily related to their family, but something that's important to them, okay? Because what we don't want is the picture of the family, which a lot of people will choose, but instead something that's really meaningful um, that they can share. And then we set time limits, three minutes, have them do that. You're going to do all those good therapy skills that you would um, normally use around listening, asking open questions, but keeping it brief and focused and begin linking your group members together. The most important things here are no treatment in reviewing the expectations. And then the next time you get together, the focus would be on treatment. So meet and greet. Open groups question came up yesterday when we were talking about this. You could do this with open groups, particularly if you're bringing people in in a scheduled sort of way, um, but it may not be quite as necessary. All right. So let's talk about the mechanics of the session here. Uh, 
So, and that really begins with before people arrive. And I want you to think about scheduling wisely, meaning it's really hard to go back to back in virtual environments because of the energy that the virtual environments require from us as the group facilitator. So it's better if we have a little longer break so we're able to clear our head, do the things we need to do and come back into the break. Um, or back into the next group with having more than 10 minutes or 15 minutes between a group. It's just really difficult otherwise. Second thing is jumping on early, making sure that you're on, you're connected, you've got all your um, materials up and available, things are working for you. I tend to like to do an email reminder for folks, even if they've got it on their calendar. So if they, if for some reason they don't, they're on a different device, they can find that link easily and get on there. I like to test my sound and those kinds of things as part of all this. So make sure that I'm able to stream sound, all of that. And then finally, if you have someone else who's a co-therapist or someone like that, talk to them ahead of time during this preparation time. We at PRI call these folks wing persons. And so we say, talk to your winger beforehand and just be clear about what the expectations are, who's going to be doing what, who's covering the chat box, um, who's doing different elements of the session, if you're sharing things, all the rest. All right. So that's before people arrive. Then as people begin to arrive, one of the things that we encourage people to do is use a waiting room. Um, so folks don't necessarily come directly into the session. They can log on when they're ready to do that. It places them in a waiting room. In Zoom, you can personalize that waiting room. You could put a photo in there. You could put a photo of your waiting area at the office or your group room. If folks have been coming to your group room before, you can also put a message in there. You know, we'll be with you in a few minutes. Looking forward to our time together today, whatever it is. And then you can also, again, within Zoom, I'm a little less clear about some of the other like WebEx to what degree you can do this, but you can send chat messages to people in um, the waiting room as the time is coming closer. So if you know folks have jumped on really early, you can send them a message, say, hey folks, I know you're here early. We'll, uh, we'll let you in a couple minutes before the hour, just so you know. And then I tend to bring people in before the session time. So if we're gonna begin on the hour, I'll bring them in about three or four minutes before the hour. And I greet everybody personally. And in the process of doing that, I'm doing a sound check, making sure they can hear me and I can hear them and we can troubleshoot any difficulties that are going on. So it's welcoming people in. And it also allows me to address the issue of cameras. If folks don't have the camera on, I will ask directly, say, hey, um, your camera's not on, Bob. Is it not working today? And we'll just sort of hear from him or her about what's going on. So I just make the expectation that that's what's going to happen. And I check in when it doesn't occur. Okay. And then now that we've got people into the room, we've done the sound check in and all the rest, I want to start intentionally, meaning I don't want to just sort of roll into the group without having given it any thought. So like today, we did that moment of breath, which can be a really helpful thing to kind of bring people into the room, get them settled and calm, but it's got to fit you. If it doesn't fit you, that's okay. Um, and as I saw one participant say it was triggering for this person to have that experience, then if you know that's the case for your people in there, talk with them about what that's about and are there things that you could do that would make that better or do you just need to skip that activity? Um, we train our folks for our programs to begin all of their sessions with a positive present focus question something either that happened in the recent past or is happening right now, or something that they're looking forward to or anticipating, okay? And the reason why we do that is because for many people, particularly now, 
um, this is a difficult time and they tend to come to our groups with negative emotions, particularly if they've been sent there by someone else. So I'll just say this to you for a number of years, I worked with adolescent boys and I did a lot of individual therapy in that setting. And for all of the years I was doing that, I never had a single one who came in because he wanted to be there. They always were there because somebody else thought that they should be there. And so there was always some degree of negative emotion that people would have, particularly early on in the treatment process. After we had built some rapport, done some engaging, that would begin to shift over time. But even then, folks would come in after a tough day and they would have negative emotions. And part of what the research from positive psychology tells us are that negative emotions tend to, tend to focus us very narrowly on the problem area. They release stress hormones and all of those kinds of things at a time which is already quite stressful for people. So if we begin to shift that focus to a more positive focus, we actually begin to change that hormonal balance going on in the person, what kind of hormones are being released. We literally open up their visual field and we get them to begin considering the possibility of other options. So if you think back to the things that I had you do there in the chat box, I asked you where you were checking in from, what you were looking forward to this holiday season, and what would make this session today useful for you or productive for you? Those were positive present focus questions and the one was kind of anticipating a positive thing. Okay, using the chat box can be a great way to begin and trans transition people into the room. There are many other ways to do it as well. You can ask people, that's always great, but I like the check chat box because it kind of allows people to engage without having to do a whole lot to begin with. And then for our programs, we ask people to do a uh, check-in on whatever takeaway they had from the session before. And we do that in a particular way. We ask people to um, inquire about the takeaway in a manner that includes everybody in the group. So I want you to think about this with regards to open groups. So if I am a new person coming into a, a group where I have not met all of these people, this is an anxiety provoking experience. And the first question that gets asked of me is one that's positive, present focused, it allows me to answer. I don't have to have been a part of this group before to answer that question. If it's a question and it's focused on addictions, since that's one of the areas that many of you work in, if it's focused on, did you have a slip or a lapse um, or that kind of thing this week, it focuses on negative emotions and if I'm new to the group, I'm not sure I wanna talk about that stuff yet. It doesn't feel safe to me around all those things. And then we move from that into a discussion about homework that I wasn't exposed to. I can't really participate in any of those beginning elements of the group. And so I'm not yet a member of this process. But if I start with a positive present focused question, and then I present or I ask people to talk about the takeaway from the last time in a way they could use, then I might begin drawing them in. And so the way we do that is we say this, someone remind the group about what it was that we were working on this week. What was the takeaway that you all were working on? And have the group members do it rather than you. Someone will typically do that and then ask the question, okay, what happened with that? We know that some of you got out there and were able to get it done. Some of you intended to get out there and it didn't happen. Some of you might not have been so sure that it was gonna be useful. And for some of you, this is the first time um, hearing about that. Regardless of which of those categories you're in, what do you think would have happened had you done that? Or if you did do it, what did happen? Now we've invited all the members of the group to participate there. Now, if somebody is consistently not doing the takeaways, that will be a discussion point, but it's probably a discussion point best handled in an individual session and not necessarily in the context of this group. All right, 
which brings us to the meat of the session and somehow having Turkey seems like a, a good sort of reference point since we just got through Thanksgiving here. So we have all these other things around it, the side dishes, but the meat of the session are really the things that we're hoping to deliver or have happen as a part of this uh, time together with these young people. And I want you to think about the same good group skills that you've been using when you're in person apply here, and they may apply even more. So eye contact remains important. And part of what you want to do is be able to look into the camera when you're talking, as well as look at your participants. And so having people up not in presenter mode where one person appears at a time, but in gallery mode where you can see everyone is really important. And then you wanna watch the whole group and see how people react and respond and notice those things, talk about those things. You know, when, when Steven said this, Tanya, I noticed that you seem to have a reaction to that. So you're starting to draw people in in the same way you would in person. And then your listening skills really matter, those strong listening skills. And I don't just mean nodding and being affirming and going, aha uh -huh, and things like that, but really using reflective listening statements and not just staying at the surface level, but going below the surface and doing reflections that connect group members together, recognizing common themes. So you're using your reflections to help create that group experience. So it feels like this is the group's group. This is not your group, all right? If you're going to show materials to your groups, like using brief videos, I really do encourage you to keep them brief. There is some research out there that suggests that videos online are optimally about two to three minutes long. And maybe the second best is three to five minutes. So if you're showing a 10 minute video, you're likely starting to lose some people along the way. So think shorter rather than longer. If it's a long video and you wanna show all of it, break it up, have some discussion and then watch more of it. And that really leads me to the next point there, and that is change the focal length. Now, this is really important with young people, but it's important in general when working online, that simply doing the same thing for 60 minutes, kind of like what we're doing right now, where I'm talking a lot, really wears groups out. That what you want to do is talk for a little bit, have some discussion together, have people do an activity, put them, partner them up, have them talk as individuals, put them into breakouts, show a movie, come back, have some discussion, moving people back and forth. So change that focal length. And then the last thing is thinking about finishing strong. You know, where is the finish line and are you keeping track of that? Don't just arrive at the 29th minute when you're, at, when you're ending at 30 and say, oh, I guess we're out of time here and then sending people out of the door. Think about how am I gonna bring these things together? How much time do you need? How do you tell when it's time? What are your methods for doing that? And what do you say? Do you do the summary? Do you have the group members do the summary? Do you ask them, you know, what's your takeaway from this session today? And then do you assign takeaways? Now, I want you to notice that in our program, we talk about these as takeaways. We don't talk about homework because first of all, if we're working with young people, they don't wanna do any more homework. Second of all, most people don't wanna do homework. That's just kind of a natural reaction for folks. And what we really want to begin doing is getting them to think about the things that we're doing in therapy or in treatment are not meant to stay in treatment, but they're meant to be applied out there in the world. And so we want to consciously help them begin taking away those things and doing them out there. All right. So this would be the time normally we would take a little break. I want to give you just a moment if you need to stand up and stretch or um, move around a little bit. We'll let you do that real quickly and then we're going to move on. So why don't you take just a second to do what you need to do to recalibrate yourself. Earlier when before you all joined we were talking about 
wouldn't it be nice if we could all just have graham crackers and a mat like we did when we were young in kindergarten or in um, daycare or that kind of thing to uh, sort of help just kind of take the edge off on the roughness of the world. Might be some real value there. Okay. So let's talk about equipment for a little bit here. Okay, because equipment really matters. Okay, I want you to think about this as investing in your tools, your, the, the tools of your trade here. And we're going to start with the most important one if you're working virtually, and that is your connection to the internet. Okay, your upload rate matters. Your download rate doesn't matter nearly as much as your upload rate. So the fact that you can stream Netflix without it glitching is great, but what really matters is how well does your computer lift things up to the internet? And the goal that our IT people talk about is if you can get it in the 12 um, megahertz range, 12 to 15, um, that's about where you want to be. Now, my system kind of hangs around 11, but it does reasonably well. If you're down around the two or the three, you're gonna have some trouble and you might wanna talk with your internet provider about what you can do to increase that. Lights matter. I wanna show you what I mean about all of that stuff here, that lights matter. So. Here's with the lights on, here's with the lights off. It's a very different experience. You can't really see my face when that happens. And especially if there's a window behind me and I become backlit, you can't tell what's going on. So what I encourage is that you make sure that you have a light shining on your face so people can see you and can see you adequately. If you don't have one that works well for that purpose, they are for sale out there on the internet. You can get some that can clip to your computer. You can put them up by the camera so you just have those shining on your face so people can see you. I would also encourage your young people to put a light on as well because they'll often be in dark spots and you really can't see them. And I think you'd just be straightforward around this and say, I wanna be able to see your face and I can't do that if it's so dark there. So even though I know you might want it a little more, you know, kind of dark that I'd really appreciate it if you turn that light on. Now I know I saw in the, the Q and A box that some folks are asking about what happens if the school district won't allow you to do that. And that's, a, that's another challenge. And why don't we come back to that at the end? Sound also really matters. Um, I want to talk about earbuds and those kinds of things that are Bluetooth connected. Bluetooth tends to work great and it drops out periodically. So I'm not a huge fan of using like AirPods or those kinds of things to connect to your computer with. I'd much rather have a hard line connection around those things. I purchased a microphone, um, looks like this, got it off of, um, Amazon, you can find them other places, you know, from 50 to $70, you can find a good quality mic that has sound dampening for other things around you. So it's just picking up your voice and not all those other things around you, plugs into a USB on your computer. Um, and camera is also important, high definition camera is great, but think of it this way is it also uses a lot of bandwidth. And so you'd like to have a sharp picture, but if I have to choose between a little fuzzier picture, but better sound and better in a more stable um, platform when I'm working, I would choose to have the better sound, more stable platform, but a nice camera. Again, if your laptop doesn't have one, most of the newer ones do. Um, you can purchase one that can be plugged into your system. And this is the other thing that I think is absolutely critical. And that is a second monitor. If you're gonna be doing web-based treatment, 
you want to have a second screen to be able to handle looking at all your people. And if you're showing materials or you've got things you're going to be moving back and forth on to be able to have those things up and to be able to see them. And the best way to have that real estate is to simply have a second monitor. In most computers that are 10 years old, old or less have the capacity to do that. You simply go out and you can buy even a TV, a flat screen TV that's smaller and you could use that as a second monitor um, and hook it up potentially with an HDML or H, yeah, HDML cable. And then make sure you keep your software updated. Whatever platform you're using, whether it's Zoom or WebEx or GoToMeeting or Doxy, or um, whatever you're using, make sure that you keep that up to date and particularly around security patches. Okay, so that's a lot of information that I've written through relatively quickly. What I wanna do with you now is a little poll. I wanna check in with you for just a minute here. So let's do this. Actually, no. Okay, for this next part, we're going to do a little poll. And we're going to have you use your phones or your tablets to do this. So I want you to get your phone out or your tablet out. And you're going to go to this website, the one you're seeing hopefully on screen here, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And you're going to enter this code, 7212415. And I want you to put in what's your biggest concern about telehealth. And as you do that, your screen, we should see the screen begin to change here. So let's kind of see what you're thinking. All right, kind of moving around, translating activities, engaging clients. Looks like most of you are feeling relatively comfortable with the technology. Of course, these were the folks who answered early, so they may be feeling more comfortable with the technology than the folks who are um, little later responders. Okay. Yeah, engaging clients seems to be heading down the back stretch here. All right. Okay, so I want you to notice something. This is important information for me to know about what's going on with all of you. I could have asked you this question at the beginning of our presentation today, but notice when I ask you the question, what is your biggest concern about telehealth? I'm asking you to jump into that negative emotion pool. And that, to, and that will start us off on a different path than if we started the program in the way that we did. Now, one of the things that the research shows around all of this is that if you begin a program or an interaction with a client with a focus on strength-based things, areas that are going well, positive emotions, that it tends to inoculate them to some of the dealing with some of the more difficult things that they may need to talk about along the way. They feel more able to do that. And so asking you this question now has a different impact than if I had asked you it straight out of the blocks would be the thing I would have you notice here. So let's do another one of these. I'm just going to escape here. Looks like things kind of evened out a little bit, but engaging clients feel about the same. And let's go to this one. You're gonna use the same location and you're gonna to respond to this question. 
how are you feeling about being here right now in this training event? And you can put in a word or two, Sarah, and we'll see those pop up. How are you feeling about being here right now? Grateful, positive, fine, at ease, better, content, reassured, hopeful, interested, encouraged, stable, hopeful I can do this, appreciative. All right, intimidated. Oh. All right, great. And it's kind of fun to watch that thing grow and change as people enter those things in here. Um, People refer to this as a word cloud. You can set up a free account on this um, through um, mentimeter.com um, to be able to do these things. And so here's like a, one of those little interactions that doing with your young people can be really useful where you, you're going through your program and say, okay, let me just do a check in a little bit. How are you guys feeling right now? And have them do a word cloud. Um, pretty straightforward. You can have those things ready to go programmed. You can program in questions. You can do some brainstorming. And as you saw, it's pretty easy. And with uh, young people being digitally native, it makes it pretty easy for them to get out there and do that stuff. So great word cloud here. And it also gets gives you a chance to see what some of the other emotions might be that people are experiencing. Like if I look at this here, I can notice that, you know, for the most part, things are feeling pretty positive for folks, but there's a few folks feeling anxious um, and that kind of thing here, stressed. So it's important to know that and a few people feeling sleepy. And so maybe it's time to move on. All right, so let's go back to sharing. And I want to go to a slightly different spot now. Let's go. I want to share with you a tr uh, treatment session from Prime Solutions right now. And as I said before, Prime Solutions is, is a program that we developed um, and provide for people. And it gets used with young people as well as adults. Um, it does use images, kind of PowerPoint sort of things, and has a number of different activities, focal length. It uses motivational interviewing as the clinical glue that holds everything together. It uses the stages of change as a way to understand the change process. And then it has a number of cogn cognitive behavioral um, sort of elements to it, as well as relapse prevention and some of those things along the way. So that's just a little bit of background on what that is. Let me pull this up here. Actually, stop that. Okay, so this is who I am. This particular session is about values and how they fit into people's lives. And I want, to, I want you to pay attention to how the things we've been talking about might come into play here. And I'm just gonna, uh, at times I'll use the language I would use with clients and other times I'll just speak to you as providers around all this stuff. So we start out with an image here about this is who I am and then we move into the checking in um, process here. And so we would begin with a positive present focus question. And um, given the, the time of year, and if I was dealing with uh, young people that were in school, I'd say, so what are you looking forward to about the holiday break that's coming up? What, you know, what are you anticipating you're going to do with that, that you're going to enjoy? Um, and so there's my positive present focused question. Then I would ask the takeaway about, so what happened with those things that uh, we provided last time? I know some of you probably got it done, some maybe didn't. Um, and if you had a chance to get it done, what 
um, if you didn't get a chance to have it, uh, to get it done, then what do you think would have happened? And find out from the group there about that. And then we move into the meat of the session, which is all about values and how values um, influence choices and how we can move away from those values through the different choices that we make at times. But what I don't want to do is lecture at people because I know that that's not particularly helpful for them engaging in the session. So when this picture comes up, I might ask them, so when you see that word values or think about the word values, what comes to mind for you? And have the group tell me about what comes into their head. And then I might ask them, and what do you see as sort of the relationship between values and choices? How do those things fit together? And so in the process of doing that, I am helping draw the attention of the group towards particular elements that we wanna cover, but the group, is, the group is the entity making the arguments around these different things. They are the ones who are talking about them, not me. And then I use my reflective listening skills to respond, um, to shape, to draw attention to, to link people together. So it becomes a really active component of what it is I'm doing in an online environment, just like it would be if we were in person. And then I move from that discussion about values and behaviors and how they fit together to talk about a person and say, so now we have a video of a person who kind of moved away from th the things that were most important to him in his life. And that doesn't typically happen in one fell swoop. It often will happen by a series of choices. And so it's not some, something that somebody consciously makes, a choice that someone consciously makes. So I want you to just watch this video here, have that in the back of your head. And I want you to notice what are Billy's values? What seems to matter to Billy here? Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and play this video so you get a chance to see this. He's got three prior DUIs. This would be his fourth if he's convicted. He hasn't had a driver's license since 1980. Mr. Garrett, legal limit in the state of Tennessee is 0 .10, you registered 0 0.13. On Friday when I get off work, I feel like I deserve a few beers. And if a few beers makes me do you out of these people right here, then that's their opinion. It's more than opinion, it's evidence. Evidence likely to be used against Garrett in this, his fourth DUI charge in three years. Well, Garrett lost his license 14 years ago. That didn't stop him from driving tonight. And he says it won't stop him when he gets out either. As soon as I get out on bond, I'll have that car right there and I'll be driving to work. If they can catch me, more power to him. Okay. So because we're dealing with young people, particularly if they're adolescents, Billy's a little bit older, I'd say, so Billy's in a little different position than you are all in, in terms of age and all the rest. But as you look at Billy, what seems to be important to him? What, what are the values that you think Billy has? Um, and ask the group and have them tell me. And if they offer some things that aren't necessarily values, like they might say partying, I'd say, okay, so when you think about partying, what do you think's underneath all of that? You know, is it, is it about relaxation? Is it about rewarding himself? What do you think's going on there for him? Notice I'm not asking about them. I'm asking about Billy, which makes it easier for people to talk and engage and talk about themselves at the same time. The follow-up video here, then after we've had a discussion about what Billy values, we move in to say, so Billy gets an opportunity to see himself. And I want you to pay attention to his language. What does he say? Um, how does that impact him? And then we watch the second video here. I'll have that car right there and I'll be driving to work. If he can catch me, more power to him. That was Billy Garrett in October. I have to leave. Hey, Michael. This is Billy Garrett now. These days, he's walking, not driving, and he's not drinking. Okay, and we're not going to watch all of that right now, but I, again, just want you to know that this is a stimulus to generate a discussion and to have people sort of recognize um, what's going on with Billy and how he had an opportunity to see himself and think about his values and thinking about 
um, how his choices relate to those things. And then we move into a discussion with the group and say, so Billy had an opportunity to think about these things. It would be nice for all of us to have an opportunity to think about that as well. So I'm going to have you grab your workbook and we have a workbook that looks right that looks like this and in the back of that workbook for all of our clients each one of them gets it are some values and we have them tear those values out and then do a values card sort um, where they put their values into those values into not important important and very important with five or so of the very important and then we ask them to answer some questions about that in conversation with a peer. So after they've gone through and put those values into the different piles, then we move them into that individual work. Now, this is one of those places where you can allow people and even encourage people to kind of take control of their environment a little bit and say, so if you want to move around in your space, get to a place that's a little more comfortable to do this sorting, go ahead. You want to sit on the floor? Fabulous. That's entirely up to you. You just do what's comfortable for you, however you want to do this sorting activity. So let them make that choice. Then they go through it. They have a conversation individually. We bring them back as a group. We have a large group discussion. And those discussions use the questions to help orient the person to particular areas to think about. We move from that activity, they can do some writing in the book. Then we move into another video, which I'm not gonna show you now. And then we move into a takeaway. And the takeaway, there's one written for this particular session, but we also encourage people to be flexible and to use a takeaway that seems to fit for their group. And one of the ones that I really like is to have people use someone else to sort their values. Um, now, when they do that, I make it really clear and say something like this. I'd, you know, one of the things that Billy found really helpful is that he was able to see himself through someone else's eyes. And that can be really useful information. I know I did this with my son um, and had him do it for me. And it was really interesting to see what he thought about my values. I would like to have you do the same thing with someone you trust. So it's important that this be someone you trust. It could be a friend, it could be a sibling. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's not but somebody you trust and have them sort what they think your five most important values are. And I don't want you to argue with them about those are the wrong values or they've misunderstood you, but instead just listen and hear what they have to say. What do, what do they think is important for you? And then next time we'll bring that in and we'll talk about it. Now, if that feels like it's too much for your people or that has the potential to be triggering, then you can always use the regular um, take away from in here, but that's sort of part of the making it fit for young people is that kind of determination. All right, so let me switch back here. So that's only one particular method. You may have other things that you're using. Let's just at this point, what I'd like to do is just talk about some tips and tricks. And I'd like to invite our panel to jump in and join me and have them offer their ideas as well. And then we'll see what questions you have and see what we can answer here along the way. So some tips that I would share are when you're looking at the gallery view of your folks, notice people's spaces and be curious and offer positive comments about those things. You know, like if there's an interesting piece of art on the wall or there's something that they seem to be interested in, notice that and point that out. Um, I also think it's really important to notice your energy. What does your energy look like? The group is gonna feed off of what you bring to it. So if you're really sort of quiet and don't bring much energy, that's how the group is gonna feel. So think about yourself as sort of the initial sort of impetus to what happens in the group and really think about your face and what people are seeing there. 
All right, be playful. And I think this is especially important with adolescents that this is serious business oftentimes that you're dealing with, but it doesn't mean that everything has to be serious. And one of the things that I love with adolescents, I love listening to music. And at times with adolescents, we would have, you know, it's your session to play music. And my only requirement around all of this is that it isn't blasting so that all of us are having our ears bleeding when we get done, which means you have to be comfortable with some of the things that people say in their music. So just being aware of that provides an, an insight into who they are and what they're listening to, what's going on for them. Sometimes they'll wanna shock you, you know, they drop a few F-bombs that's the way it goes. And if you're dealing with adolescents, you know, just being ready for that, I think is important. All right. A couple other things, be patient. For all of us, it's hard when we ask a question and no one responds. All right. It's even harder with adolescents who have learned, been trained that if they don't respond, the adults in the room will fill in the space. So it does definitely requires us to be willing to wait. You need to be thoughtful about your questions, how you ask them and all the rest, but then be patient um, with what you're asking for. And then keep the finish line focus in mind. Where do you wanna to get to and are you leaving yourself enough time there? So enough from me, let's hear from the panel. What do you guys have for tips and tricks? There, this is Christina. Um, one thing that as I've uh, worked more in the virtual environment that I think is really helpful and useful is to um, become really familiar with the different features that are available to you in whatever platform you're using and making sure that you kind of keep rechecking that um, as versions of the platform updates to see what new things have been added because especially in uh, our current situation, they're updating a lot of these applications and platforms really frequently. And so sometimes something will be enabled or will become available that you can use and it will help you get a little bit more creative or uh, be able to be more interactive with your groups. Great, thanks, Christina. How about other folks? And along those lines, so being willing to try those new things and know that they might not, it might, might not be perfect the first time. Um, having somebody who can, who, who might be there to catch your back. <laughs> if like, oh, if I had, if I just have, you know, a, a buddy on this call, like, like David was calling the wingman, wing person, the winger. <laughs> like, is there somebody here who can help if I, if something gets stuck, I was uh, telling the tech team I had a group that I was leading and we were using a different platform that I'm not particularly um, savvy and using. And we put people in the groups. I remembered how to do that. And then I forgot how to get them out of the groups. And she forgot too. <laughs> and so she was off kind of, you know, Googling how do we get people out of groups when we're using BB Collaborate. And I was desperately trying to get my group back. So you know, stuff happens and just, you know, just try stuff. Same thing with, you know, the things that you used to do, the things that you did with your groups of young people are going to need some adaptations, right? If, you, if you're used to doing them face-to-face, -face, there's probably a way you can do them in this platform and how, what, what directions are people gonna need? What adjustments need? And then actually the other thing that I learned is that there are some things that I did for years and years and years in face-to-face -face settings that I've had to give up. That just, there, there was a better or a different way to teach that or represent that concept um, virtually that I just needed to find a different way. And I was flexible with that, so. Yeah. And did you find there were particular ways that were helpful in terms of thinking about it, like coming up with a different way, like what are the underlying principles you're trying to communicate? Yeah, exactly. Like what was the message? And then, and then how is this message, is the, is the right message being conveyed to the group when, when this exercise is being used virtually? And sometimes that's what I was discovering was that the message was, there was a disconnect when it was a virtual kind of thing. I'm finding one thing that's really not working is like uh, 
uh, rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions do not work <laughs> uh, virtually. Like there's just something that just for whatever reason, just, it doesn't work. So I stopped doing them. I just stopped asking rhetorical questions. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So take the feedback from the group. Are they getting out of the exercise or the activity that you have planned? Are they getting the message that you want? Is it moving your group in the direction that you want? And if it's not, what adjustments could you make? And if those adjustments just aren't enough, then just say, oh, maybe I'll try something different to get that message across in this new environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And to piggyback off of that, this is Stephanie um, off of Laura's comment of just support and know um, kind of who to go to if there's so, um, questions about the platform or the expertise. So, um, for example, on this webinar today, we have five to six people on the back end kind of helping um, out David as he's presenting and then also providing um, some feedback and um, comments and help throughout the questions and answers and chat. So just knowing um, who you can look to and just know that we are all kind of in this new virtual environment. So it's good to debrief. So like Laura was saying, debrief what worked well, what can you change? Um, and just, yeah, finding that new creative way of um, interacting, engaging people's um, thoughts and feelings and how um, we can all be together in this virtual environment. Mm -hmm. Great. That's great. Thank you. And, you know, it does bring up something that I think is really important. And I didn't emphasize it yesterday and didn't emphasize enough today. And that is growth mindset around all this. And since I know you're working with young people, this is something that's very familiar to you all. That really, this is an area where we can slip into a fixed mindset around how we do things and are we good or not good at something. And I think we need to transfer that growth mindset to this environment as well and say, some of us are, are more comfortable than others, but we all have the capacity to learn and develop our skills if we're willing to try and not have it be perfect. And so I'm constantly willing to try. And if something works great, and if it doesn't work, it's like, okay, yeah, it didn't work the way I wanted it to. I either need to modify it or do something else if it's not the right thing. Um, and so each time through it, learn something, get better at it kind of thing. So, and I know there are lots of questions coming through. So, Anne, did you, uh, did you want to review some of those with us or? I would love to. Um, we have a question that says, can you speak about research that's proven that too much device usage, such as phones and computers and video games, decreases social skills and can cause depression or anxiety? You know, I, this is not an area where I claim to have expertise, so I'm, I'm not, not even going to try. Um, but what I have seen are, I've seen research going both ways around this. And so it ends up kind of being how is the, is it the overall volume or is it how the technology is being used seem to be the critical element to me as I was looking at those things, but I have not done a thorough review. So I, I'm not sure I can provide a coherent answer to that question. It's a really great question and certainly makes sense. And I know it with, in terms of my own children that I've tried to limit device activity um, particularly around like social media and those kinds of things where we, you know, there's some, there's a fair amount of gathering evidence that always engaging with that can be pretty hard on self-esteem and increase those disorders of despair, depression, anxiety, suicidality, that kind of thing. Thank you. Um, a practical question is what's included on the netiquette form? <laughs> that is a really great question. I'm wondering if I can pull it up really quick here. So let me see if I can find mine and I will show you what that looks like. And I'm in fact happy to send it all your way and you can. It would be great. We could post it on post um, the website yeah. with the recording and the um, slides. So I think so, that would be yeah. very helpful for people. Yeah, let me just share. So this is what ours looks like. 
you know, simple stuff. Now, can I say something about the eating off camera? There's actually some research out there that suggests for organizations that are having to work in a distance way, like my organization does, that getting together and having group lunch lunches where people actually eat on camera is quite helpful. Um, so once again, that going back to the prior question, context sometimes matter around matters around all that. But in terms of treatment, we tend to ask people not to be eating during that. But if somebody needs to, we're not going to make a fuss out of it. Great. Thank yeah, you. So yeah, this is sharing that. This is helpful. And again, we'll post that for people. Yeah. Um, when providing SUD or other behavioral health services, do you have clients sign agreements about how to manage and maintain confidentiality of the other group members? Um, and if not, how do you account for confidentiality? Yeah, boy, that's, it's a hard one, isn't it, around all of that. And you can certainly have people sign an agreement. The issue is the agreement is only as good as their relationship is with you. Um, and it's the same sort of finding we see around suicide contracts and all the rest that unless there's some degree of connection or relationship with you, it doesn't feel particularly binding to them. It's simply a hoop that you're jumping through. Um, so I know it probably presents some legal um, covering of bases. So you may want to do it that way. But I think it's much more important to have a real uh, good discussion around these things with the group and then have the group reiterate them. And if you want to have a form to reinforce those things, that's great. But I don't feel like that's nearly as important as the relationship and the discussion that goes with it. I do know that for new clients coming in and all the rest that that can be, you know, how do you get forms out and have people sign it and there's, you know, secure um, programs to get those things done, you know, DocuSign and Doxy has something and all the rest um, to get those things accomplished. But I'd be much less concerned about the logistics than I am about having the conversation about why it matters. Great, thanks. Um, we have a couple of versions of this question is, um, and we talked a little bit about it, you can't force students to turn on their cameras during um, per school district rules. Um, do you or students who you ask repeatedly to, um, you know, put on their cameras, do you have strategies for how to deal with this or how to deal with pay students that you're unable to see? Yeah, I... I First of all, you have to operate within whatever the policy is of the organization or the agency that you're working with. So we'll just take that as a given around all of this stuff. And we don't want to force anybody to do um, something because we know that, you know, if we do that, we're just engendering pushback. I'd much rather have a conversation about why is this important? Why does this matter around doing these things? And that is that and just sharing with um, the students that there, there's a few things that happen. One is I know when I don't have my camera on, I tend to get distracted and start doing other things. And my observation is that's what happens with other students as well. And so we really want to have you fully present here. The second thing is when I can't see you, it makes it difficult for me to connect with you. And it makes it difficult with the other members to connect with each other. And part of what we're trying to do here is to get to a place where we feel comfortable with each other. So this helps us along the way. So I'm presenting some information, but then I'm really engaging with them around a motivational interviewing sort of way saying, so that's the information I'm thinking, what are you thinking about cameras? What are, what are your thoughts about having it on? Um, and find out what's going on with him or her. So it's less about my convincing them and more about having a conversation about it. Great, thank you. Um, since we're in a virtual setting, does anybody have any idea how to take the um, value sort and make it, how do, how would you make that virtual? Yeah, you know, there's some, been some really creative ways. And I, yeah, I'd be curious about the rest of the panelists to hear about this. So Laura and I are part of the um, 
MI network of trainers out there. And there's a bunch of people who've been out there doing really creative things using um, different kinds of programs. And there are some programs that you can use to do that. Um, so you could do, you could create it in a virtual environment. And I, I kind of like the, the tactile thing of interacting with the cards. So if at all possible, I'd like to just send the things to folks, have them cut them up and do them. That, that's exactly what I do, David. I, I send them, I say, and then I, I even actually wonder if the act of physically cutting them yourself and, and having them and then doing the activities, if there's not something to that. So yeah, I have not come up with a, an electronic way to do it. I just use, yeah, I mean, if, if they have access to a printer, they can print them themselves. They, cut, they print out an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, cut them out, do the sorting. Yeah. And there are programs you can use where you do a drop and drag sort of thing. They get more involved and all the rest and you could send them to those sites. So they are out there. Um, I just tend not to use those. I just as soon have the, you know, kind of that old skill, old school way that involves them using their hands a little bit. Because again, I think for adolescents, if we're trying to move them away from the screens and all the rest, this is a way we can do that in a concrete manner. Great, thank you. Um, someone asked, what are the advantages to Zoom versus Google Meets versus Microsoft Teams? Um, okay. The other, the second two are free, mm -hmm. but Zoom sometimes makes you pay for the account. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna show my big bias around all of this stuff. Okay, for many years our organization used WebEx, um, and it's a secure platform. And you know, around HIPAA compliance, it was much better suited than Zoom was early on in all of this to to be using it. But here's the thing. Whenever we used WebEx, somebody always had problems with their video. Somebody always had problems with their microphone. And so it was funny because in January of this year, we did a thorough review and we made a decision. We were going to move towards Zoom, not knowing all of that, what was going to happen. So we moved in February over to Zoom and then the rest of the world came in March around all this stuff. So I have a clear preference for Zoom, even though it costs some money to, um, because of the ease of access, people getting on is much easier than the other ones. I haven't used um, Google Hangouts or Meet as much. Um, so I'm just not as familiar. I've met in a few meetings with that and it seems to, to go reasonably well. Um, when folks have shared in that, it seems a little more clunky. Part of what I like about Zoom is the ability to share is easy. It does have some features that I like. I have to say this, I am not great with the whiteboard in Zoom. I have tried, I never quite get it right when I'm doing it. So many out there, I'm sure are really good at that and use that all the time. I tend not to use it. If I want people to add things um, there, you know, I go other routes. Um, you could use Google Docs or something like that, but just put that out there. Right. And um, in case people missed it too, Christina's um, suggestion about maybe using the uh, polling in Zoom for mm -hmm. um, the values, people could choose them, um, might also be a way and then um, I'm just really conscious of our time today. And I wanna let people know that we will put um, all of the resources on our Great Lakes MHTTC website. Um, again, it should probably take us about a week to 10 days to get everything up um, on the website so you can look there. Um, I want to Thank David for his fantastic presentation, as well as everyone on the panel and all of you who um, signed in for us. So thank you for your time, all of you. Thank you all.